Happy Aloha Friday. Welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice. And this is your host, Beatrice Contemo. We live in an elusive paradise. This morning, the state of Hawaii made national news again when our Attorney General and several human rights advocates and activists gave a joint press conference regarding the U.S. Supreme Court's decision to let portions of Trump administration's Muslim travel ban go into effect while the debate and the constitutionality of the ban as a whole. Here in the state of Aloha, we feel it's our kuleana to continue to fight until the Muslim travel ban is stopped. We are the Aloha state, after all, and if there's one thing Hawaiian culture is well known for and admired is for its spirit of justice, freedom, and kindness. We believe that our diversity, not only as a state, but across the globe, is what makes us stronger and wholesome. Not always paradise in the state of Hawaii. We have major social justice issues. Take, for instance, the health and wellness of our native Hawaiian women and girls. We still have long ways to go. Today we have a very special guest, Renuka De Silva. She is uh, from Sri Lanka, had quite a few years detour in Abota, Canada, and uh, then moved to Hawaii. <laughs> so she's a citizen of the world. And uh, she's a PhD student at the University of North Dakota. She focuses on the marginalization of native and indigenous women from various diasporas of Hawaii. And she will help us better understand how engendering descriptions during colonization times left this legacy that still impact Native Hawaiian women and children. On that note, welcome to our show, darling. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you. So, uh, where are you based these days uh, as far as residence? Okay, so these days I'm in North Dakota mm -hmm. uh, pursuing my PhD. Mm -hmm. in educational foundations. I was born in Sri Lanka. I think you mentioned sort of the other way around, but I was born in Sri Lanka, but left Sri Lanka mm -hmm. when I was 12 because my parents were traveling and my dad was doing his PhD uh, from UCLA to uh, University of Hawaii, uh, these islands. This is going back, way back. And then- What do you mean? You're only 29. Yes, you can't yes, be yes, that yes, way Absolutely, back. absolutely. I <laughs> uh, cannot uh, disagree with that. But um, yes, so uh, from, um, from Hawaii, we um, went to Africa. And from Africa, I had a choice of going to university anywhere around the world, and I chose Canada. So I have been in Canada s since 1979. I'm still a citizen of, um, of Canada. Then um, I came back to Hawaii to do my master's in educational foundations. I then decided to go to North Dakota to do educational foundations and research. And the Aloha is bringing me back to the state of Hawaii to do my work in uh, women's issues. So tell me a little bit about your time in studies uh, here in Hawaii. I know you've been here for a little while. We've been going to a couple of conferences and you're doing fascinating group studies with women. That's, That's right. what it's all about. Yeah. So I, as I mentioned, I'm doing my uh, research work um, regarding women, uh, Native Hawaiian, indigenous women, and women from diasporas, various diasporas who may have been here, I mean, their families for several generations, who consider themselves Hawaiian. And um, so what I'm doing is talking to them and trying to understand their understanding of health and well-being. And it's fascinating, the stories that I hear, um, mainly because when we think of um, health and well-being, you're thinking, oh, are they eating the right food? Are, are they, you know, how are they managing the food systems? Really, what's coming out is health and well-being is the wellness of Mother Earth. Mm. So it's women and Earth and the food sustainability interactive and giving and take that which gives is returned so looking after I'm, I'm making it very broad but looking after our earth gives us back so there's not just um, uh, the uh, tangible aspects of food and uh, living but then there's the spiritual aspect as well
Mm. So, which is very, very interesting. Absolutely. And it's also really interesting to see uh, how Western cultures measure wellness mm -hmm. in, in health from a public health perspective. And yet, even though that's important, uh, from an indigenous perspective, I, I think that part of sustainability and that inter connectedness with nature is really what promotes and sustains health. So this is what you're finding out here. Well, the thing is, the real system of living close to the land, living with the land, really changed, right, with the colonization. And this is not just in Hawaii, in other parts of the world as well, but because I'm focusing more um, here, so what has happened is when the very first people landed, when they first came in, they saw um, people and their lifestyles as something that's disorganized, that didn't fit into their scope of measurement, in a mm -hmm. sense. Um, and efficiency. Them, efficiency. Well, I mean, it was more of a, uh, of a uh, capitalistic view of doing things, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't understand that, and they call these people savages. I mean, this is throughout the history. So let's bring in the religion, let's bring in order, let's bring in all these things that they are used to seeing and measuring people. We call it worldview um, uh, uh, theory. <laughs> that part of it is if, they, if these ways of living didn't fit into their ways of thinking and being, well, then they're primitive. Mm -hmm. So you've got artists like um, um, Paul Gauguin. I mean, he was mostly in uh, 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 Tahiti, uh, French Polynesia, uh, where they, he started painting of this primitive life, this exotic life, the elusive paradise, which wasn't a part of his life, but wanted to bring this to the Europe, European um, uh, gaze, rather, view. Uh, so. But that's not what it was. I mean, if you look at even in his, uh, his paintings, I mean, there were so many things that happened that was not nice for the, the, the native Hawaiians or the native uh, uh, Tahitians, I should say. But there were so many other things that if it didn't fit into the European Eurocentric way of thinking and being, well, then they're below them. Mm -hmm. So let's... Uh, Let's assimilate them. Let's uh, enculturate them, uh, so that they look and speak like us, be like us, uh, follow um, and work like us. Except they're below us. So it broke up this whole um, uh, uh, in indigenous or um, um, local way of looking at things. The beauty, the the respect, the many gods that they worship that made sense within their life mm -hmm. was all broken down and was pulled apart to, well, you've got the guns and all of those other things coming in with the colonization. Mm -hmm. um, so they were sort of uh, dissembled. You know? So help our viewers understand uh, the meaning of the word re-gendering, mm -hmm. because it's quite a tall, it's, yeah. a, it's a tall yeah. twister there. Yeah. <laughs> there many people have not heard that That's outside right. academia. So if you look at, um, I'm I'm learning these as well. I mean, thankfully okay, to the, for us <laughs> yes, this you know, thankfully for the uh, to the women whom I have been interviewing, um, this amazing native uh, Hawaiian and indigenous cultures have had. Um, women um, side by side by with men and um, participating in life, uh, in uh, in uh, rituals, in in uh, ceremonies, in in life, basically. So they were equal in many ways, uh, but of course, European wasn't that. So they were trying to. So when you're talking about en engendering. And that is, okay, a woman does this, a man does that. And it kind of fitted really into their scope of things because um, what the colonies brought to us was uh, very much uh, uh, moving away from agrarian uh, culture into a more capitalistic, money-producing cash crops. 
So you couldn't have everybody going there. So you, farming had to go out. You had to produce, like, say, coffee, for example. I mean, this produced cash for more travels for the, uh, you know, uh, for the uh, colonizers, uh, bringing in money, go, taking it back home, and bringing in more people and getting uh, turning in the land for other cash crops like pineapple and you've got your sugar cane and yeah you know so that happened here as well so when these patterns get introduced the family gets broken down so then it becomes mostly um, you start assigning roles within family structures and then those families have to um, uh, answer to whoever who's supervising them, who's above them, and usually it, it was the colonizer. And, uh, and that is completely Eurocentric. Uh, yeah, you think structure. different. You speak a different language. Your uh, your native uh, Hawaiian language is pretty well diminished. Now, another thing I've learned uh, from these ladies that I've interviewed is that they weren't allowed to tell their stories. It was an oral tradition. They weren't allowed to tell the stories because stories give um, life. life, resonance, uh, birth to uh, the story that carries through. And you learn about um, uh, the ways of the land. You learn about fish ponds and the lo'i uh, patches and the traditions. The, the traditions. Exactly. But that is not conducive to the European way of thinking. You you got to get rid of all this because so if you go back several uh, generations, you'll find that the grandparents had no stories. Grandma had no stories. Great grandma had no stories. Why? Because they were stopped from telling stories. So it's not that they were not that able to tell stories because they weren't there. It was the suppression. Suppression and oppressed. They were and oppression. Yeah, exactly. Yes. They were so that they wanted to make sure they meaning I have to correct myself when I say they. So um, the colonizers, for example, mm -hmm. it, uh, it's a process of assimil assimilation, assimilation because this has happened throughout the world, not mm -hmm. just here. No, yeah. But since I'm concentrating my work on here, so that's why I'm referring to um, it didn't it didn't help them uh, mm -hmm. to know these stories because you know what that sets these the native Hawaiians in this case up for rebellion right you don't want any of that you gotta clean them up clean their mindset um, bring them over to the English way of thinking or the French way of thinking whoever the colonizer is mm -hmm. so um, that way you lose you lose so much of the culture mm -hmm. and the beauty of all of this is that now the women are gathering again to talk about the cultures take pride in the cultures take take the land that is theirs do you know in in the Hawaiian uh, among the Hawaiian this is their country this is no state this is their country, and it's been occupied. So this is very interesting. Which is true, mm -hmm. uh, even though we are not a state, and there is, you know, the whole part of uh, militarization and how we are not really recognized as a kingdom. But I think for Native Hawaiian, especially after. Native Hawaiian revival, I think in the hearts of many men and women, this is their kingdom. It was a kingdom. Yeah. Uh, there were several kingdoms. That, I mean, it was. Mm -hmm. What happened was an illegal takeover. Yes. We know that. Yeah. 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 Oh, no, it's very true. So uh, we're going to take a break very shortly. Okay. And uh, um, we're going to dive right in uh, into the second segment of our program and we're going to talk more about your research and what you hope to accomplish with it because I know you have grand plans for it. I have plans of coming back. All right. <laughs> so uh, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. A veteran, my victory was finding the strength to be a champion. My victory is having a job I can be proud of. At DAV, we help veterans get the benefits they've earned. My victory was finishing my education. My victory was getting help to put our lives back together. 
DAV provides veterans with a lifetime of support. My victory is being there for my family. Help us support more victories for veterans. Go to DAV.org. Aloha, my name is Raya Salter, and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, which you can see live at from 1 to 1.30 every Tuesday at thinktechhawaii.com and then later on YouTube. I am an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. And on Power Up Hawaii, we come together to talk about how can Hawaii walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. To do that, we talk to stakeholders all over the spectrum, from clean energy technology folks to community groups to to politicians, to regulators, to the utility. So please join us Tuesdays at one o'clock for Power Up. Let's start again. Welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice. This is your host, Beatrice Cantalmo, and uh, we are here with our wonderful guest, Renuka de Silva. So, Renuka, we were talking about your studies and what you're finding in this um, reclaiming not only of cultural identity and pride, among women on, uh, of all ages in Native Hawaiian, the entire diaspora mm -hmm. region that you're covering. But one question I have for you is with uh, um, colonization and the um, consistent effort you know, to erase the memory of uh, local people's culture through you know, erasing of the language, of traditions, during that period of time, how did Native Hawaiian history was uh, documented since it was oral history? How, how do you base some of those um, early oral traditions in your research? Okay, so <clears throat> there are still stories that families have. Okay. okay. And it's only now that the, these ladies, these families, have um, found the strength, I would say, to bring out and be proud of it. Because remember, they're coming from a background where if you talked about your identities or that you, um, your native uh, uh, Hawaiian, it wasn't something to be proud of. So there was a time period where they, uh, these people were forced to identify with uh, other cultures, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then the, the European, when the Europeans were here, and also the researchers, they documented everything from their lens. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's, it's difficult, but I think they're still finding stories and chants and bringing back the aloha, bringing back the the uh, the pride, mm -hmm. and talking about rev and reviving uh, the fish ponds, the loe patches, which I alluded to before, because these are the transformational. But there's a long way to go because I'll, uh, you know one of the reasons is that we need to get the young children involved, right, mm -hmm. to bring bring that back. The schools need to be involved. Uh, to take uh, field trips, take them out, mm -hmm. show them. And to include and that into, into curriculum. curriculum. And you know what, yes. being a teacher, I'm a former teacher from um, York Region District school, school Board in Toronto, Canada, Ontario. Uh, you always think, oh, curriculum, I mean, it has to fit into the curriculum. No, curriculum is this wide source. You can bring in any part of critical thinking and asking the children, giving them space to develop sometimes their own curriculum, the interest, because you know what? Kids are uh, think tanks themselves, the brilliant minds. They know a lot more than what we give them credit for. They have questions. And it's, it's unfortunate this curriculum business sometimes put a stop to these questions. And, um, no, that, that shouldn't, you should open their minds up, ask them, hey, you know, um, what are your interests? How could we, so when you open up qu uh, questions that way, and when you allow the, the students to critically think and engage, then wonderful things happen. Absolutely, and I think also, going a little bit off tangent, but still connected mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. your work and the intention of what you, you know, doing, is that, 
you can't even start to have the conversations about asking what do people want to do in their learning environment if they don't learn real history. And I feel that to these days, you know, Native Hawaiian history or history of indigenous people across the globe is really not uh, quite emphasized and taught in a proper manner. Um, at least not in this country, and I'm not seeing much of that, you know, in Hawaii. I mean, there has been efforts, but it's still a very Eurocentric, and I think in Hawaii culture, there's still a very heavy Japanese influence in the curriculum structure. So, like, even for a Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander child, they, sometimes it's really hard to even relate or to feel that moment of pride and contribution, you know, in your own land, in your own domain, because the references that are being made uh, does not mention those oral traditions, the, the beauty, the majestic sides of uh, what, is it, what is it all about to be long to an indigenous root and, and to be in Oceania mm -hmm. and, and to be connected that way. So this is where I think the DOE <laughs> needs to expand and open, step out of these boxes and really work for the children. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in, a, in, a, in an era of um, standardized testing and all of these other things. I mean, children have different ways of learning just because, uh, and, and the arts. I mean, the first thing that gets cut, cut okay? Uh, it's arts, but arts are very, very important. It, it teaches you compassion. It teaches you creativity. It teaches you to listen and to work and collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, so when, when you take that away from children and you sort of focus them in the direction, maths and uh, language are very important, mm -hmm. but kids cannot just learn in vacuums of these little pods. Mm. They need the outsources. They need to be out uh, in, uh, in, in out, out, outside, outdoor education, learning about, um, uh, you know, uh, the plants and the ocean and the importance of coral. Uh, Hawaii is a perfect place for that. But I also understand uh, uh, that you have to have special permits and all of that. I mean, this is unfortunately part of uh, litigation. The constraints, yes. Yeah, constraints that, uh, that yeah. schools have. So there is hope for more equity and diversity, not only in curriculum development. Up. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, lucky for us, there are beautiful professionals like yourself that can bring not only that light, but also the guidance to be able to help us refine uh, current structures in curriculum development so that we can really well let's see I think I think coming back to I really do feel feel that I belong here because I mean I grew up here and I've traveled around the world come here but I'm not coming here to really say oh this is where we went wrong and this is who they are but to really bring back the aloha and to say hey, these are the things that we we want to take we want to do and to to give some sort of a um, voice and to work with the women who know their land better you know who really have pride in their own land so i'm just an outsource coming in to be a part be a collaborator um and be really proud of uh, of the land. Absolutely, mm -hmm. I think in many ways, you know, our roles as human beings is to be bridges, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, to help uh, with that connection. And it will be the many voices uh, that will make that you know sheep uh, uh, that shift happen. And uh, so back to your work. Uh, I know that uh, you have spent a great amount of your uh, academic life studying marginalization and, uh, uh, and how the regendering legacy in, co in colonial times you know, is still impacting women and young girls, not only Native Hawaii, but in indigenous culture. So mm -hmm. my question to you is, 
in the context of what you're doing, what are you seeing as the trends of marginalization? So how is that reflected in, in today's culture? And what is your hope to shift that? Well, when we look at even modern women, educated women, who are paid less for the same job as men would do. In a way, we have allowed that to happen throughout. I think there needs to be more voices of women uh, supporting other women throughout. I mean, this is throughout the world, uh, more so in the Western world than really the uh, Asian you know, uh, stream. But um, I think we've allowed that. I think we need to take a more active, more proactive, but not a, um, uh, not in a way to attack, but to create more awareness mm -hmm. and to stand up for those. Mm -hmm. And the women need to um, take a better stand and say, no, I don't like that, or yes, I will, and follow that through. Because a lot of the times, I know, I mean, uh, they're not credited with the work that they do in the families or um, uh, with rearing children and all of that. Mm -hmm. But I think there needs to be more support from women for women. Mm -hmm. That is when doors open. That is when change happens. That is when a shift happens. Mm -hmm. But if you stand back and say, well, you know, they'll do it. I don't have time. Well, then that is that has been the legacy in a sense but we need to change that we need to change the perspective so perhaps more civic engagement yes. in the form mm -hmm. of advocacy mm -hmm. in education collaborative, collaborative, yeah. collaborative yeah. Uh, partnerships but which is really very indigenous mm -hmm. like nothing is done in yeah. that structure of hierarchy That's that right. we are yeah. known for I mean, we talk about yeah. if you talk about native hawaiian i mean they fought like you know warrior princesses warrior women warriors they they fought along with the men like i mean it was great culture here it was great so it's it's sad that that was all broken down but it was broken down that was the only way that these people could be ruled over by and change so i think women i think all over the world but um, if we are to create change women need to come together and have uh, and be supportive each other and uh, talk about you know what are the shifts and why are we doing it we're doing it for us for our children for our families mm -hmm. for the beauty of the land um you know uh, to uh so that we can feed everybody not mm -hmm. some people you know uh, in in the days of the past there was no starvation uh and the homelessness, homelessness. Or the I mean, these are all modern problems yeah. brought about the modernization, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. And uh, what was learned that does not serve us or our environment can be unlearned as well. And on that note, I can't believe how quickly our show yes. came to an end, but it's not an end, it's a hiatus. I hope to have you many more times uh, with us so our viewers can continue to learn more about your findings and about ways that we can all co-create and collaborate to continue to in highlight uh, the beauty and, and the richness and the depth of uh, indigenous people's culture and wisdom. So thank you so very much for being here. Thank you for having uh, me. I said that we were going to do our own together, so would you like to hold my hands? Yes. We're going to leave our viewers with a... Uh, oh. <laughs> so this concludes uh, our uh, Perspectives of Global Justice program for today. And until next Friday, ahoy ho.